an honor for me to announce the next speaker, which is Antonio Lieto. Antonio Lieto is an associate professor in computer science at the University of Salerno, Italy, and a researcher at the ICAR CNR Institute in Palermo, also in Italy. And his research is at the intersection of artificial intelligence and computational cognitive science, and his main research topics include common sense reasoning, language, and knowledge technologies. So please welcome Antonio Lieto. Antonio, it's yours. Okay, so thank you, uh, Ricardo, and all the uh, organizers for uh, inviting me to give this uh, keynote. It's really an honor for me. So the topic of my uh, talk so uh, is uh, about uh, um, mainly the kind of confu confusion that we have in AI today, uh, and that this I think that this confusion is uh, mainly due to the sort of wrong interpretation and the following theory ascription of the um, to the capability that we associate to the output of artificial um, uh, artificial system and i think uh, and this talk will be mainly a methodological talk so not a really a technical one but i think it is important in any case i think that we can have a sort of methodological help uh, coming from the field of uh, cybernetics, which is uh, nowadays called uh, conti science, because the problem of uh, the ascription of capabilities to the behavior of different kind of uh, uh, artificial system is a very no, a very old one. It's not uh, um, it's not new. And uh, uh, what kind of confusion I'm talking about? Well, I'm talking about these kind of uh, things that uh, probably. Uh, most of you uh, have seen uh, in the past months. So there was a, um, a letter uh, asking for a pause of uh, AI uh, experiments, or there are also um, personalities in AI like Hinton warning about, and many others, working about exist existential threat, threats coming from uh, AI. So what I'm going to um, talk about is uh, the point that I think that this kind of consideration are mainly due to the sort of methodological confusion that I'm going to uh, talk about. In particular, the confusion is due uh, um, to this kind of uh, um, configuration that I'm going to explain in a, in a minute. So what we have is a sort of, uh, uh, what we do is usually a sort of comparison between the output of uh, humans uh, in any task and the output of AI systems in any task or even in, integ in integrated task, okay, in joint, uh, joint task. Uh, the problem arises when we have, uh, let's say, results which are uh, um, comparable or when we have results of the AI which are better than the one um, that we are able to provide in a specific kind of uh, uh, tasks and a specific kind of uh, uh, test. Uh, what's the problem? The problem is that if we only do this kind of behavioristic comparison, if we just compare the behavior, the output, okay, um, we can't do this kind of, we can't interpret the output of the uh, AI that, for example, uh, is indistinguishable, can be indistinguishable from the one of a, a, a biological system, let's say not only, not only humans, but also animals. Uh, we cannot do this kind of, uh, we cannot interpret this output as a, a sign that uh, the underlying competence and capability that explains the same output in humans, um, we cannot do this kind of uh, a transfer. We cannot ascribe this competence to uh, a particular AI, um, AI system. But this is exactly what, uh, what happens. What happens when we uh, start to, let's say, attribute to the output of system like large language models, but also other kinds of AI and robotic systems, uh, um, uh, competencies like uh, intentionality, like uh, uh, consciousness, uh, like uh, because this kind of ascription, okay, is something that can lead then to the sort of uh, reasoning chain that uh, um, let's say also uh, include the possibility of exist existential AI uh, threats. 
So what I'm going to uh, show you now is uh, that uh, this kind of, uh, let's say, interpretation, this kind of uh, theory ascription based only on the behavioristic comparison of the output of AI system and, uh, uh, let's say, natural system is uh, um, uh, wrong. And uh, um, let's say the main razors in which, uh, um, let's say, uh, I would say before the explosion also of GPT, uh, GPT-3 and uh, following uh, types of large language models, at, at least the most popular one, because the, the first uh, large language models were already there in 2017, 2018. But I mean, this is the main one of the main topic of this um, book that, uh, let's say, came out a couple of years ago. In particular, in, in, um, in the book, I tried to explain and to characterize the book by uh, uh, asking the following question. So what characterize biological, biologically or cognitively inspired AI system? What are examples of biologically or cognitively inspired AI system? How do they differ? from standard AI system, uh, how can we evaluate and compare different types and different classes of biological, biological um, inspired and cognitively inspired AI system? And how this class, this category of artificial system can help us to develop the next generation of technologies which go beyond uh, somehow uh, deep learning. So the scenario in which uh, uh, I think we are all interested in is this one. Okay, so the idea is that if we took inspiration from a biological point of view, also from a more abstract point of view, from a cognitive point of view, if you want to model, let's say, high-level heuristics in order to, in AI procedures, in order to, let's say, provide a kind of intelligent behavior in which we are interested in, in an artificial system, we also expect, to some extent, that, uh, uh, let's say, that the output of our uh, artificial system can explain something about the theory of the natural system, what we know about the natural uh, uh, system, which was somehow uh, hidden, implicit, uh, let's say, not, uh, not given when we started the, uh, the, the, um, the, design, uh, the design phase. So the problem is, is that we want to go from, uh, uh, um, let's say, human to artificial system and back. Okay, We want to have this sort of reverse uh, inference. The problem is that uh, we, uh, this is not a, a new, let's say, kind of uh, um, uh, approach. This approach comes directly from the cybernetics, which was the first discipline, let's say, so uh, pre-AI, let's say, uh, that uh, proposed a sort of unified uh, study of organisms and machine. But the problem is that if we really want to know to what extent we can, uh, let's say, provide, uh, we can attribute to the artificial system, to the output of artificial system, an explanatory power with respect to what we know or what we don't know about uh, a natural system that has been taken as a source of inspiration, we need to consider different kinds, at least two types of design perspective, which are the so-called functionalist and structuralist uh, design um, perspective. In a nutshell, let's say in the functionalist perspective, which comes from the philosophy of mind. Uh, it was, uh, let's say, originally uh, um, proposed in another field by the, the philosopher Hilary Putnam. But uh, what is called machine functionalism actually um, assumes that in order to have, uh, at least in, in its most naive assumption, okay, assume that uh, in order to have this explanatory role, it is somehow sufficient to have between the natural system and the artificial system, a sort of weak resemblance, uh, a surface re resemblance of the internal components of the two system and of, let's say, the functioning of, of the, the working mechanism that provide the output of the two uh, systems. So the important thing here is that there is a weak resemblance, okay? There may be some kind of components which are the same, but it is not important to have a sort of, uh, uh, let's say, more uh, concrete grounding on the, the, what we know about the natural system. And also for the procedures, for the mechanisms that are known, the, the important thing is the, part, the, the fact that they function as, that's why it is called functionalism. So the important thing is that uh, this system can provide, given a, a certain input, 
at different levels of the system construction, they can provide the output that we also, uh, as uh, we also as biological entities are able to, uh, to provide, okay? The other kind of approach, uh, uh, which is the structuralist approach, uh, assumes that it is not sufficient to have this sort of surface resemblance. But uh, the, the important thing is to have a much more constrained way of building programs and uh, 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 system between what we know, the theory that we know that can come from neuroscience or from quantum psychology or from biology and so on and so forth about uh, what, what we uh, do as humans or as animals when we perform a certain task and the corresponding models, the corresponding procedures, the corresponding system that we build in the system. Now, in, in the book, I show how these two kind of design perspectives can be seen as, uh, let's say, extremes of a continuum. And we can attribute to, uh, based on how a system is designed, okay, different kinds of explanation to the output that is produced by an artificial uh, uh, systems. And you can see an example here in the slide. I have no time to go into the details of uh, each of them, but this is, a, a, let's say, these are types of expl explanation uh, um, are uh, inherited from the uh, from philosophy of science, okay? So they're a classical way of attributing meaning and explanatory power to certain, to uh, let's say scientific uh, scientific models. And this is what I call, what I already uh, told you. In functionalism, the idea is that we uh, it is postulated that the sort of sufficiency of uh, uh, weak equivalence between quantum processes and components and AI components and uh, uh, um, uh, procedures. The problem of functionalism, with respect to the problem of providing an explanatory role with respect to, uh, uh, to, to the behavior of the artificial system by using the theory that comes from the natural system, uh, is uh, exemplified in this very famous example, which is found, which you, you can find in, uh, let's say, I think all the textbooks in uh, AI, including uh, um, Russell and Norvig book. So the point is that in this case, when we uh, compare birds and jets, they are uh, both able to provide the same function. Okay, they are both able to fly, but of course, the way in which, let's say, the jet fly is completely different with respect to uh, uh, the way in which birds uh, fly. So this means that uh, from a design perspective, birds don't have any, uh, sorry, jets don't have any kind of explanatory uh, uh, role with respect to how the birds uh, uh, fly. So the fact that uh, they are able to provide the same function, the same behavior, okay, doesn't justify, in any case, this is evident, the ascription of the underlying competencies of the birds, in this case, to the corresponding, uh, let's say, competencies in uh, uh, the jets. And this is the sort of errors that we are doing, uh, some of us, let's say, uh, um, I hope not in this conference, uh, uh, but in, in AI are doing, uh, when we ascribe this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, interpretation to the behavior of um, systems like large language models. On the other hand, structuralism, as I mentioned, provides a much stronger equivalences between biological and cognitive mechanism and AI procedures. So it is not sufficient in this case to uh, focus only on the functional organization of the components in order to have a sort of human-like comp uh, human computation. Now, of course, also in the case of structuralism, if we take the structuralist too, serious, too seriously, we end, up, end uh, up in what is let's say, known as Wiener paradox. So uh, based on the fact that if you want to really be the sort of structural models of a biological entity, we need exactly that uh, uh, the, the very same model, the very same entity we are going to model, okay? And uh, in, uh, by using the word by Filishin, uh, uh, the, the same problem can, we, can be formulated in the following way. So if, if we do not formulate any restriction about the model, we obtain the functionalism in the sense that I mentioned before of a Turing machine. But if we uh, apply all the possible restriction, then we reproduce a, a whole human being or a whole animal that it is not, let's say, feasible. So we need the good proxy models, okay, that allows us to uh, create system that can be collocated along this uh, functionalist versus structuralist continuum. 
And we need a precise way to collocate the different kinds of system along this continuum in order to attribute um, to the output of such system the correct explanatory role with respect to the kind of competencies that uh, um, we also uh, know in, uh, in humans or other biological entity for specific uh, uh, task. And another point is that we may have many different types of structuralist models, okay? So it is possible to build structural models of cognition based on different kinds of level of uh, uh, abstraction. So there is place not only for, let's say, more uh, biologically uh, inspired, uh, not only for biological inspired research, but also, also for research in uh, more traditional areas like county systems and heuristic based uh, um, approaches that probably use the, uh, let's say, um, sort of hybridization of different kinds of techniques. So the first thing I want to uh, uh, say in this talk is that we may attribute to the output of artificial systems an explanatory power. So uh, let's say, uh, uh, let's say we can say something about uh, also how our cognition work only if we build structurally valid uh, models, which are realizable in different, uh, uh, in different uh, um, ways. First thing. Second thing, we cannot attribute by just observing the output, the behavior of natural and artificial system, the competence that we that comes from the, the theories, from the experiments of neuroscience, biology, and, and uh, cognitive psychology, that explain the, the, uh, a certain behavior in humans, we cannot, uh, cannot provide a, a, an ascription as is in artificial system, okay? The ascription can be done only in the case, uh, only certain case, only if we have, let's say, systems that are built according to this kind of structurally valid uh, way. But uh, if we look at what AI nowadays is uh, um, doing, well, we see that uh, this kind of biological or cognitive inspiration sort of, uh, let's say, uh, mainly ended, ended in, the, in the mid of the 80s of the last centuries, because modern success, successful AI systems like, uh, I don't know, IBM Watson or AlphaGo uh, or even AlphaFold, uh, or uh, uh, let's say large language models uh, like ChatGPT, so on and so forth. They are functional system, okay? So they don't have any kind of explanatory role with respect to the way in which we are able uh, uh, to perform the same kind of task that they are able to uh, uh, to perform, okay? This also holds for, as I mentioned, AlphaFold and for system like ChatGPT. Uh, and let's say this family of, uh, of system. An interesting, let's say, elements that shows, how, let's say, the, 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 um, the um, a peculiarity of functional system is that, that uh, in some cases they are able to outperform humans in specific tasks, but they are also do very strange errors, okay? Uh, in previous talks, uh, I've seen that there were mentioned uh, hallucinations in LLMs, but also, let's say, in symbolic system uh, or hybrid system like the one of IBM Watson, we have very strange results, very strange and unexplainable uh, uh, behavior and outputs. For example, this, this is uh, in the link, um, you can see a, a very famous example of IBM Watson uh, uh, that uh, um, answers to the uh, question concerning US cities uh, provides the answer of Toronto. I've put, I, I inserted the, the link in the, in the slide if you are interested. Or we also, everybody knows about the problem of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, neural networks in this case, because convolutional neural networks, when they are attacked by adversarial networks that can change the categorization of uh, uh, images by uh, making some uh, very small uh, types of uh, uh, one from one to three pixel changes. Okay, something which is completely not visible to uh, to human. Uh, eyes. Or we also know that uh, recently a human amateur uh, beat uh, a top Go playing uh, AI system like AlphaGo, okay, 
uh, by simply using very, uh, let's say, uh, sort of uh, idiotic trick that were not, let's say, in the training of the of the uh, of the uh, system. Or as also in the previous talk by Scott Falman was uh, pointed out, this system have completely lack of common sense. This is a, a very a sort of funny example of a, a um, classification, image classification of a, a, a um, let's say a cow according to the um, according to uh, the uh, AI system. But we may have different kinds of example. Okay, uh, so the the problem is that. Uh, um, th th this kind of non-human errors can be done along all the class of uh, system, symbolic, but mainly, uh, let's say nowadays also, this involves uh, uh, neural technologies, uh, including transformers or different kinds of neural uh, architectures and so on and so forth. And this also include, for example, system like GP3, uh, GPT-3 and 4, which, for example, have problems in anaphora resolution, in temporal reasoning, in the handling of negation, this is an example of DALI, which is used the same technology from uh, of uh, um, um, GPT. In this case, the prompt was to provide to generate images where there was no giraffe standing next to the man, and all the images generated were, uh, let's say, uh, had a, a, a giraffe in the in the uh, in the prompt. So, this is a symptom that this system, like all the neural system, have a still a foundational problem with the compositionality, okay? With the possibility of having, of actually building blocks of meaning and put together meanings in a, let's say, uh, intelligent uh, way. And I mean, there are many examples of this, ty this, uh, this type. And for example, some of these limits uh, are starting to be recognized, okay? Uh, and also uh, uh, some of the, let's say, successes of this AI system are starting to be a little bit, uh, mm, let's say, uh, evaluated with a different eyes because one of the main, uh, let's say, problem of uh, um, systems like uh, uh, ChatGPT and so on and so forth is that, uh, for example, there is the human ghost in the machine. We know that from GPT-3 to GPT-4, uh, uh, and it is written now also in the in the FAQ, frequently asked uh, questions of uh, uh, ChatGPT. The conversation are reviewed, and uh, let's say the the the, um, the in case in which the people start to uh, let's say provide uh, the signaling of errors, these things are manually corrected. Okay, so are, uh, there is a human human review. So this means that uh, what is uh, sold. Okay, uh, the, what they sell as emergent capability from, uh, let's say, one version to another is actually a lot of manual labor. Okay, so this is an important thing to to consider. First, second, we don't know what I mean. What's the difference between the training set and the test set of this system? We don't know anything about uh, this kind of closed systems, in particular the ones owned by the. Uh, uh, corporations uh, by this giant uh, uh, corporation. So we need to be uh, uh, should be more careful when, uh, let's say, really providing this kind of uh, um, interpretation of uh, of the result that we have obtaining these the, these elements. These are not scientific, uh, let's say. Um, uh, scientific products. These are commercial products. Okay, uh, so this means that uh, they are improved in every, let's say, possible way because the goal is not to understand uh, how and what was the, the the limit of transformers. The the point is to sell the uh, the product. This is something we should keep uh, uh, in mind. So. Now, given this kind of uh, state of affairs, the problem is here is how we can say in a quantitative way, how we can measure the biological and quantitative plausibility of an artificial system. Because if we have something to, to say about how a system can be collocated along the functionalist, the structuralist continuum, then we know which kind of explanation, we, uh, what kind of attribution we can do to the output of the system by starting in the case in which it, this is possible, from the theory 
that we know that explains in humans or in biological system the, the, uh, the same behavior that uh, the, the artificial system is able to uh, replicate. Now, the most, uh, uh, well, one of the most, let's say, relevant uh, papers um, trying to answer to these kind of questions was this uh, famous paper by Barbara Webb, uh, Can Robots Make a Good Model of Biological Behavior, where Barbara Webb uh, said, look, I think that there are seven dimensions that uh, we should consider uh, in order to see whether or not a robotic model is actually a good, uh, let's say, structural model. In a, in a sense, okay? And if we uh, go through this dimension, the first is biological re relevance that show if and eventually to what extent a computational model can be used to generate and test hypotheses about a given biological system. Then there is the second dimension, which is level, which basically tries to see what are the basic elements of the model that have no internal structure or whose internal structure are ignored, the generality. So how many biological systems the model can represent, abstraction, so how much detail it is included in the model with respect to uh, the natural system taken as an, a source of inspiration. And then there is this notion of structural similarity, which let's say uh, where Barbara Webb says, we have to take into account the similarity of the mechanism behind the behavior of the artificial model with respect to those of the target biological system. The performance match means the similarity of the performances between AI system or robo robotic system and uh, uh, biological system and the medium because for Barbara Webb uh, it is important which is a, a, a roboticist it is important that there is a body okay in in a, in the system in order to have this sort of uh, comparison fair comparison now this list by Barbara Webb was very influential but I think that the, there are some limits in the Webb's account first if we look uh, to these dimensions, the concept of biological relevance and structural accuracy are highly overlapping. And then the, another problem, which is a problem, uh, let's say, a methodological problem overall of, uh, let's say, um, um, yeah, computational community science, is that there is not a clearly defined method that uh, allows us to operationalize these abstract dimensions, okay? So how can I say that this is more uh, structurally accurate uh, with respect to another system? Uh, what does it mean to have a biological relevance? Relevance. So what are the elements that I can really take into account? Another problem uh, in the web proposal is that uh, she considers as medium only the presence of a, a physical body. body. But for example, do not consider, does not consider artificial alternative physical model of computation, for example, based on quantum computers or neuromorphic computing, where we have hybrid, uh, let's say, biological and artificial network networks which are uh, connected uh, together. So what I did in the book is to provide a much more uh, succinct and, uh, uh, let's say, operative proposal with respect to the web account by using the minimal quantitative grid. So minimal cognitive grid is a, a let's say, non-subjective graded evaluation frameworks that allows to provide both a quantitative and qualitative analysis of, let's say, the, about the biological or the cognitive plausibility of artificial system in both specific task and in, the, let's say, in a multitask setting. So in a nutshell, the, the, this grid is called the minimal because there are only three elements, okay? And then it is a, a, a sort of a, a operative way of uh, evaluating the adequacy, the structural adequacy, and the plausibility of biological and cognitively inspired models, um, artificial models. First, the first element which is considered is the ratio between functional components, functional parts of a, a complex system, because as I mentioned in the Wiener Paradox, we cannot build uh, entirely a structural model, okay? So there are, will be some elements that will be functionally uh, designed and some other parts that will be structurally designed. So the point is that we can take, given the whole, let's say, pipeline of a system, we can say, okay, in this part, this component is functionally designed, this part is structurally designed, and so on and so forth. And we can take the ratio, so we can count, actually, the ratio between these components. We can take the generality. This is also an element that took, is coming from the web proposal. So how many tasks the system is able to perform? Okay, only one task, 
a bunch of tasks. This, this says something about what are the, uh, let's say, invariant mechanism that are used uh, uh, for intelligent behavior in different tasks, which, uh, which is an important uh, uh, element for uh, general intelligence. And another point concerns the performance match, but not only in, let's say, the, the positive cases, the cases in which we have a comparison, uh, um, a fair comparison uh, between the, the, the output of the system and the output of the humans, okay? So in the good case, but also in the bad case. So we have to consider also the errors. If we look at the kind of errors that this system do, this is, a, let's say, this is a, a symptom of the fact that the mechanism that lead to that kind of behavior in the good case are completely different from the ones that we have also in biological entities. And also, let's say, um, by using psychometric measures, okay? So the time is another classical psychometric measure that, you, that is used. If we take all these three dimensions, these minimal three dimensions, which are can be quantitatively, we can count and qualitatively assessed, okay? Into account, then uh, actually what we can do is to compare to rank uh, different kind of artificial system based on, on the, their degree of uh, uh, plausibility from a biological or from a, a let's say, a quantity standpoint. For example, in the first case, the, the goal of the functional structural ratio is to evaluate the biological cognitive adequacy of the artificial system via a sort of system dissection of its components and mechanisms. And the uh, uh, second point, generality, we want to evaluate in this case by counting the transferability of a given system model to different tasks and biological cognitive function. And then of course, we want to compare in the performance match, as I already said, uh, let's say we want to have a more fair comparison that is able to provide some indirect uh, indication about the fact that uh, the, the, the systems, the mechanism, the procedures that are used in the, for generating the output of uh, the artificial system can be, uh, let's say, uh, somehow, uh, can resemble somehow in a much or, or less constrained way the ones that we know in uh, biological entities. Now, if we use this kind of methods, we can see this is, let's say, something that can be easily done, that uh, we, we can map on a sort of 2D space, okay, the kind of AI systems that we, uh, let's say, have, uh, that are, are, let's say, the most famous nowadays, and we can see that they are functional systems, which is not a bad thing, but the point is that we cannot ascribe to these systems, let's say, theories, and the knowledge that we ascribe to the underlying competence that is shown in humans or in other biological entities, okay? Why? Because they are just on another spectrum of, of, of the continuum. So um, this means that, uh, let's say, most of the um, confusion that, uh, this is my, my main claim, most of the confusion which is going on nowadays in uh, AI and robotics is due to this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, methodological uh, misconceptions, okay? The fact that the system is able to provide the same kind of output of a human or a better output than, than the human doesn't mean anything about the underlying competence, okay? We cannot provide this kind of uh, ascription. The minimal cognitive grid is a way to systematically let's say, evaluate this kind, of, uh, uh, this kind of elements and can provide a quantitative and qualitative, let's say, ranking system to actually, uh, let's say, uh, put up, uh, on this kind of uh, 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 continuum different kinds of uh, uh, system and the kind of uh, explanatory attribution that we can attribute to them. Uh, another point is that uh, differently from the web proposal, uh, the minimal quantitative grid uh, is also has been also applied uh, to uh, hybrid bionic systems, so neuromorphic computing. This is a recent paper that was say published uh, um, last year um, on frontiers in uh, robotics and uh, and AI. But I have no time now to go into the uh, details. So summing up, really to uh, close. Uh, what I try to show you in this uh, short presentation is that behavioral performances are not sufficient to ascribe cognitive faculties to AI systems. So this means that also behavioral tests, like the Turing test, and most on this line, don't say very much about the actual, let's say, intelligence or the, the underlying competence of a system. If we use 
these terms competence intelligence in the in the way that we uh, uh, tend to use in when we describe biological intelligence another point is that in real world context the gap between natural and artificial system is still enormous there was a, 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 a an opinion paper by uh, Norvig, I think a couple of days ago, about uh, that said uh, artificial general intelligence uh, uh, is already here, but uh, where it is? I mean, we don't see it. <laughs> where it is this artificial general intelligence? So there is a lot of marketing that is done, a lot of pressure that is done along this side, but I think that we should uh, keep a more scientific uh, uh, and, um, let's say, uh, cautious uh, way of uh, using the terms when we describe uh, our own work as scientists. Antonio, and uh, another point Ant Antonio, I think is important. Uh, five yes, five, five, to... five minutes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm finished. I'm finishing. So another important point is that uh, I think that models working on in in the in the present and future model working working on the challenge of integrating inter in integrated intelligence like cognitive architectures which is, the, the, let's say, the field in which I've, been, I've made the most of my uh, uh, contribution, let's say, in the last uh, uh, years, even if I didn't show you anything now because I did a methodological talk. But I think they will really play a major role in the, in the, in the future. Because that now the technology looks major for providing, let's say, forms of integrated the, uh, intelligence. And I think cognitive architectures are, and biological inspired cognitive architectures are uh, a good platform for, let's say, um, trying to know more about what are the, the, the real elements, uh, uh, underlying elements of intelligence in both, let's say, uh, humans and machines or biological systems and, and machines. So this also means that uh, we should uh, really try to collaborate uh, more between uh, uh, um, AI scientist and the computational community scientist. Okay, uh, there are other people uh, in the audience. Uh, yeah, Alexei, uh, Angelo, Angelosi. I think um, most of of you are already uh, aware of this kind of uh, uh, let's say challenges. But really, I mean, this is something we should uh, push on. Uh, another point that I want to stress is that uh, well, currently <laughs> functionalist. AI systems, they work not because are not biologically or cognitively inspired, but despite that fact. I think this is the, the interesting interpretation uh, key that we should uh, uh, keep. And uh, mm, uh, a way uh, through which I think uh, even the functionalist uh, AI systems uh, can, be, um, can be used to explore something about the intelligence is that they can be used to explore, let's say, alternative path, let's say, non-biological path to possible uh, minds. But still, I mean, this is also a symptom of the fact that we cannot, uh, let's say, justify the ascription of something that comes, that explain our competence um, for a particular kind of behavior also to explain the, the, um, the behavior of functionalist AI uh, system. And this is something I'm, uh, uh, let's say, working on uh, nowadays. So um, uh, this is the conclusion. I'm ready to take questions. Thank you, Antonio. So uh, <laughs> we have time for a question. Yeah. May I? Please. Okay. <clears throat> uh, uh, hello. Um, um, I'm going to present your a bit in your perspective, I guess, which is kind of rare in artificial intelligence uh, world. Uh, uh, the the option, the other option to use neural networks is actually compensate to substitute biological neural networks. I mean, nervous system of humans. In the case of medical cases, uh, and there are a lot of um, patients, uh, like one billion of them, billion of them uh, all around the world. And uh, what I see in your uh, approach really valuable for that, if you think about that, uh, the criteria of similarity, but I haven't seen any formula. Uh, that, but you mentioned that there is quantitative way to do things. And if you think of, uh, <clears throat> Uh, implantable device that could do the calculation instead of the 
uh, injured, for example, spinal cord or uh, injured brain because of the stroke, and that could substitute those structures in, in the biological uh, neural network, we have to have those criteria to minimize to actually what you are kind of, according to my understanding, actually uh, understand uh, the minimal cognitive grid or minimal neural grid or minimal something grid, whatever you put it like, um, to put that in a, well, an implantable device that could you put in the body. And you really have to be really careful and to understand how far you are with your electronics from the biological signals, from the biological nature, from the biological structure and functions and all the uh, parameters that you have mentioned. What do you think about that? Yeah, so and can you give some details about that? Thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much for the question. I think uh, this, this uh, aspect of neuromorphic computing is indeed very, uh, very important. Uh, what I did, I mean, I just mentioned it. There is this uh, paper in which the uh, minimal quantitative grid has applied exactly to case of uh, uh, neuromorphic computing. So hybrid uh, uh, hybridization of uh, artificial neural networks and nervous and biological uh, and nervous uh, uh, um, tissues. And uh, what's come out is that because minimal quantity grid is a methodological, let's say, tool, but it is, uh, let's say, um, it, it can be applied also to the case of neuromorphic uh, devices because it can tell you in which cases, and this is what I do in this paper, so I strongly recommend it if you are interested in this line of research, uh, it, it really tells you in which cases this kind of, uh, let's say, implants uh, are... Uh, functionally designed, so it means that, okay, they provide the same, they function as, provide the same output of the biological, corresponding biological uh, tissues, and in which other cases it can be, it is possible to um, uh, have more structural uh, ways of, um, they are more structurally uh, built. Most of research nowadays is also ba based also in the, in the research on exoskeletons and so on and so forth, on functional replacement. But there are other possibilities and that, that have been explored in the, um, in the paper. But I think this is a methodological tool where we can, you can really see the difference, not just talk qualitatively about the difference. So I think this is the, the real um, gain. One more question, Alexei. Uh, hi, Antonio. So uh, you addressed a really important question, how do we evaluate AI on uh, human likeness and all uh, cognitive measures? And uh, well, I, I'm completely with you. What you call, uh, however, what you call structuralism, I w to me it is still functionalism because you are actually talking about functions of structural components, uh, reproducing them. Uh, but there is another uh, possibility what people uh, talk about when they uh, consider qualia and internal uh, subjective experience. We cannot, of course, uh, measure that. We cannot access that directly, but there is one thing we can do is uh, to measure how it feels uh, to others, how people perceive that intelligence. Do they believe that uh, this robot is uh, really a conscious being, that it feels something, uh, can understand us, and I, I believe that this is uh, ultimately what we need because we, we need this uh, intelligence to be accepted by the society as as an intelligent life form, uh, so to speak. But, but uh, the question is, um, suppose we satisfy all your constraints of your functional and structural criteria, would that guarantee us getting to this perceptual uh, criteria? Sorry, I mean, I can't hear you very well, uh, the last part. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, I can hear okay, you. Okay, okay. Okay, and the last, uh, let's say, few sentences, I, I think I'm, I missed the, the connection. But okay, uh, so uh, you mentioned if, if the, the uh, system can satisfy all these criteria, and then I stopped uh, hearing. But my question is, would that guarantee satisfaction of the perceptual subjective criteria? 
from the people perspective. Mm. Okay, so uh, well, it's a lot of questions in one. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if I have the answer to all of them, but the, let's say a uh, first thing that I want to uh, to say is that uh, you are right that uh, when uh, we let's say uh, use this term structuralist, we mean something which mixes functionalist elements and structural elements. This, why? Because it is not possible to build an, a really complete structural model. So we are always somehow in uh, let's say some point along this uh, uh, along this uh, axis but we are never on the complete structural axis this also happens for very simple biological uh, um, animal uh, um, entities okay so first thing uh, second second thing uh, the, uh, there are different kinds this is the why I, I let's say put this slide on there are different kinds of uh, explanation that we can provide to systems which fall along different points, let's say, in uh, uh, this space. So, of course, we can attribute something to the, to, uh, to, to the system. There is my daughter that attributes uh, to her dolls a lot of intelligent uh, capabilities. But this is something, and we do this all the time, okay? So we anthropomorphize uh, a lot the, the, the behavior of the output, in particular when we don't know how the internal model of uh, the, 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 the artificial element works, okay? This is the, the, the kind of explanation you are talking about, is the teleological explanation. So we attribute scopes, intentions, uh, uh, so internal, let's say, states to systems to which we, for which we don't know very well how they uh, they work but uh, as you can see here on the slide this is uh, one of the types of explanation that we can uh, let's say provide but in the case in which we don't know more because i mean i didn't have time to go here into the theory of the different types of explanation that uh, can be used but uh, the the point of building let's say uh, systems that are more towards the structural let's say uh, um, um, part, let's say, of the, of the spectrum, is that the more we add constraints, okay, which are justified from by what we know about neuroscience, biology, by, by uh, quantity science, and so on and so forth, the more we can add specific type of uh, explanation, like the mechanistic explanation, uh, which is the most important one, I think, in the in the literature about uh, quantity science. Uh, then another point was about uh, the, uh, um, uh, if you understood correctly, uh, the um, internal subjectivity. So uh, what I want to say with the minimal quantitative grid is that uh, the more the more there is, a, let's say, a, because there will be only uh, always a gap. Okay, because all the let's say models that we build are all are, all, are always proxy models with respect to what we know okay about uh, our uh, ourselves the more we build something which is close to uh, let's say what we know about biological uh, uh, entities humans and so on and so forth the more the more we can let's say try to attribute the theory that the, or one of the theories in, in this case in consciousness, because there is not a unifying theory of consciousness. But let's say the more we can attribute, we can justify the output of that system uh, with respect uh, with the, the, the theory that also explain uh, the, the same uh, behavior, the same uh, function in, uh, in humans. But now, let's say in AI, we have nothing like that, okay? Uh, so we are really, really uh, talking about systems that are on the functional spectrum, which is good because they don't care about uh, many things that uh, they care about uh, building uh, better technologies and they are useful, of course. But the problem that they see is that uh, there is a misuse of the terms coming from the cognitive vocabulary, okay, to the explanation of the performances of the systems. So... My, my answer is yes, if we go really towards, let's say, the, the, uh, the, the more structural side, we are justified 
to, let's say, also uh, use the theory that we know that explains certain function to justify the output and to explain, to interpret the output of the system. But in, in this case, I mean, uh, what may, most of the AI is doing, uh, I mean, we are not, uh, um, we are not there. And also in the case of biological system, there are a lot of simplification that we do, of course. I think that the best that uh, we have, I mean, we have also in the case of biological inspired system is a system where the functional component is still, uh, let's say, largely majoritarian. It makes sense because there are some compromises to, to, to have when we build uh, complex systems. But still, I mean, this means that we need more research on how to build more structural, uh, let's say, um, components if we want to really have this kind of uh, transfer, let's say, ascription from the human to artificial cognition. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Antonio. I'm afraid that we have passed a little bit above our time, so we conclude this uh, invited speech. Thank you, Antonio.